Our guest on the pod today is Skylar Bolin. The Arkansas native has been playing international basketball since the 2011-2012 season. Following four years at NCAA Division II Missouri Southern, he has played in Germany, Denmark, Austria, Sweden, Germany, Greece, Poland, and Denmark again, where he joins us from today. But without further ado, uh, welcome to the pod, Skylar. Nice to nice to visit. Uh, yeah, looking forward to the to the next uh, next little while. Yeah, so. Um, a little bit about you, Division Two, like we said off the top, Missouri Southern. Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of information uh, from you back then in, in terms of uh, pretty much played right away. I think we're the conference freshman of the year and, and consistently played mm-hmm. after that. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself because, you know, you know, we're not going to necessarily know a lot about the Division Two guys, but a lot For of sure. you kind For of sure. like make up the bulk of European basketball and wind up having good long careers. But Tell us what you were like before you got to your now decade long pro career. For sure. Um, yeah, it's been, a, I mean, it's a long time ago. Missouri Southern, my last year was what, 10, 11. So, uh, I mean, it's been 12 years over here now. Um, it's been a grind, man. I mean, uh, in high school, I was, uh, I mean, even smaller and skinnier than I am now. Uh, you know, I didn't have many, uh, much interest, many offers. Um, and, uh, Missouri Southern took a chance on me, uh, offered me, uh, I was at a camp in Kansas city and, uh, the assistant coach was there, gave me an offer and said, you know, come be a backup your first year and then, uh, see what happens. Um, and then, uh, crazy as it was the starting point guard that I was supposed to back up, um, got injured. I stepped into the starting role and, um, kept it for four years, you know, and it was, a, it was an amazing four years. It was great, uh, situation for me to be in a lot of minutes, a lot of, um, you know, I had a lot of uh, a lot of my shoulders um, and I was, you know, supposed to be the man there. And we had a good team. Uh, and it's an interesting fact about it. My senior year, all five of our starters came to Europe to play professional basketball and four are still playing, which is uh, doesn't happen very often in Division two. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was a great four years and, um, you know, was fortunate uh, to, to be able to, to get an uh, opportunity to come over here because, Again, from a Division two, it's not uh, not an easy thing sometimes to get noticed. And so not only for you, but in terms of your teammates as well, that that's really not a mistake, not only from their talent level, but also how did you and you all really become acquainted with that there's a, a post-playing or post-college career for you? Yeah. And it might be overseas. It's not necessarily going to be the NBA, but... Right. At what point was there a discussion, whether it was with coaches, whether it was an agent or something like that? What did that look like for you in terms of saying, you know what, that actually sounds like a somewhat decent thing for me to do after I graduate? For sure. I didn't have a clue about overseas basketball, true, until, uh, you know, uh, my, my junior year, we had a, a French guy on my team, Vincent Tiba. He's who, a couple years older than me, but he still plays, I think, in second and third division France. And that was literally the first time I'd ever even thought about it you know and just talked to him a little bit and then um you know still didn't think I would have an opportunity you know who wants a a 6'2 6'3 non-athletic uh white guy that that, uh you know that plays below the rim and this and that but um I had a had a good senior year and I think the right near the end of my senior year I started getting a couple messages from agents um and then um I got a a random Facebook message from uh my, my very first coach uh I think it was probably in probably in February or March of uh, my senior year from Stefan Goschenhofer. And I remember seeing this Facebook request. I said, who is this guy? And who, who is he is trying to scam me? What is this? And um, that was the beginning of a, of a, of a, you know, I immediately accepted the offer once I made sure it was a real thing and talked to, talked to Stefan. And um, yeah, that was the beginning. And uh, the cool thing is I still have a, a great relationship with that guy. So uh, yeah, from the very beginning, it's uh, it's been fun. And as far as that goes, your first offer, at that point, did you have an agent to go through the process with you? I did. I did. I, I had actually signed, um, after my senior year, signed with, um, it was a guy, of course, you know, I didn't know anything about the process, but it was a guy that my assistant coach uh, recommended me. And uh, so I went with him. He was at Indianapolis. And um, I mean, technically, I didn't need him because the guy, the coach offered me, you know, without me being, um, you know, sent out or whatever. Um, so technically I didn't need him, but I wasn't going to go my first, you know, my first offer without really checking in to make sure everything was, you know, uh, the right situation. 
Yeah, or it could, legal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it, it, it could go a bunch of different ways and it just absolutely. happened to work out. That's fantastic. That's good to know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah absolutely. So, a lot of scammers out there. Exactly. So fortunately, this was a good offer. Everything came together pretty smoothly for you. But you go to Germany. It is their second league at that point in time. Mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit off the pot in terms of how much you were earning and it was a, yeah. a good enough spot for you to get started. But take us through that first <laughs> yeah. year. And what that was like getting adapted to another country, your, yeah, your first first real employment after college, basically the whole mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, you know, it was I didn't I didn't really know what to expect. First of all, I had never been uh, I'd been to, you know, Mexico and been to the Bahamas, but I'd never been to Europe and um, didn't have much information on it. You know, it's not uh, I mean, obviously we had the Internet, but it, the information about overseas basketball wasn't nearly as uh, easily accessible and um, as it is now. Um, you know, so I, I signed a contract and, you know, I'm making less than a thousand dollars a month, uh, which I thought, again, at the time I was happy with, you know, it was my first experience. I go over there, you know, I told my family, yeah, I'll go try it. I'll go try it for a year two. We'll see what, uh, see what happens, you know, a good experience to travel around and see different things. I'll never get to see otherwise. Um, and then here I am 12 years later, but you know, the first year was tough. I remember my first, I think I went over August 15th. And uh, I can I can remember calling my mom and dad and being like, hey, I'm I'm coming home. I'm not. This is not for me. You know, I was homesick. I, I was an extremely picky eater. Uh, you know, I just I couldn't I couldn't adjust. You know, I couldn't drive the, the stupid car because it was stick shift. You know, everything was different. You know, we practiced on a rubber floor. You know, we didn't have a physio. We had, you know, everything was different, you know, and uh, when you go and play professional basketball, you think, oh, I'm going to play professional basketball. But in reality, um, a lot of the clubs and especially in the lower divisions are um, not near as professional as where you go to college. Um, and I think that was, that's a very common misconception is that's how a lot of stuff is over here. Um, I love that club and I love the city and ended up being a, an unbelievable experience. Uh, we, we weren't very good. Uh, we actually got relegated my, my first year. We were came down to the last game of the season and um, had to win to stay in the league, and we got beat. Um, so we ended up dropping down to the third league. And, um, yeah, tough experience there, but uh, I loved uh, everyone there. I loved the city. I loved the people. And it was, it was a really good first-year experience other than the, the wins and losses. And as far as how were you – if you could kind of expand on that a little bit, how were you received – as again, it's a, it's a second tier club, and wound up, like you said, not very good. Wound up getting relegated. Um, but what was like the the reaction from like the actual town and the people in the town? Like, you know, how many people are usually going to games, roughly? Mm -hmm. uh, and and what was the experience like around town where you, you know were recognized or you know obviously welcomed because you had a good experience? Right. But what was that actually like? Right. Yeah, you know, it it was actually pretty cool because the the team had come from the fourth league. Right. So they were in the fourth league and then one moved up to the third league and then one and moved up to the second league. So it was like um, it was kind of a big experiment for the club because they knew I think I think they really knew they weren't ready to be in that second tier of Germany, which is a, it's a good level of basketball um, as, a, as an organization. They weren't ready. I mean, again, they uh, we didn't have any full time professional Germans at the beginning. Uh, they brought in three rookies, me, um, another guy from a division two. And then um, uh, a guard from uh, Division One Sacred Heart. Um, you know, we were all rookies and didn't have a clue about European basketball. And again, with Germans that they had brought up from the fourth league. And then I think they sprinkled in one or two more. And to be honest, we just weren't a very good basketball team. Uh, with you know, we had, didn't have that much talent, and you throw in three rookies, and it was tough. But um, you know, the club was with us the whole way. They were positive the whole way. It was just a big. Ex it was a great experience, really. A uh, great. Um, it was the attendance was good all year. We played in uh, they had to move gyms because the small gym that they had played in the, in the lower leagues wasn't big enough. And so we had to move to this this bigger gym in Augsburg, um, you know, and I remember the last game of the year. I want to say there was twenty five hundred, three thousand people there. I would say on average a thousand people, if I had to guess, you know, a long time ago. But, you know, the, the experience was great and the people were, were with us the whole way because I think they just appreciated that you know, we kept fighting the whole year, regardless of the wins and losses. Yeah. And that's really a, a great experience. And not only from your personal standpoint, uh, but it winds up you getting your second job uh, <clears throat> at a pretty notable uh, Danish club. 
Uh, so, and you spent a, a number of years there and some good things happened for you personally as well. So uh, at the end of your first season, as you're looking for opportunities, how did you wind up in Denmark? So, so actually what probably doesn't show up on my resume very often was I actually went straight to Australia. I forgot to, to mention this. So I went straight to uh, our, our season ended in, in Germany, August, or April 15th, I remember. And about three weeks before that, my father was over to visit me in, uh, in Germany. And I got a random message uh, from a coach, Ken Harrington. Um, he's like, uh, hey, uh, you want to have a chat? I want to have an opportunity for you. And then two weeks later, uh, I signed a contract. And um, I went home, I think, after April 15th. I think I went home for five days. And I flew straight to Melbourne, Australia, and played in the, the Big V, which is a, a state league. And it's in their winter, which is our summer. Um, and I spent five months down there and uh, a lot of fun, very, very low level uh, basketball, but st- spent five months down there. And, um, you know, while I was looking for my next job in Europe, I was I was waiting and waiting. And, you know, I had decent numbers in Germany. I think I averaged like 11 or 12 a game, four or five assists. But again, last place team, you know, I don't really pass the eye test for a lot of people. So um, it was I didn't have any interest in Germany. And I remember it came down to two offers, uh, an offer in Iceland or an offer in Denmark. And uh, I remember um, my center in college was a year younger than me, and he signed in Denmark. And the, that team, Horsens, uh, it, we had the same agent, and they actually ended up needing a point guard and offered me. And I remember um, that was the deciding factor. I wanted to go play with, with, uh, with my former teammate and uh, led me to Horsens, Denmark. Which is crazy. Uh, the funny thing is, is it, you know, as much as we've talked, you know, my experiences in my day job as a lawyer, so I really try to do my research. And that's the fun of the overseas game is no matter how much I do, there's always these little things that fall between the yeah. cracks, even if it was like a little period of time. I mean, obviously, five months is is a, is a notable experience. But going back to 2012 and, the, and our summer, their winter, yeah. no mention of it. Not that I saw it anyway. Well, again, it was a pretty, pretty like not not the highest level at all. But, um, you know, they, they right now, I think they changed the name to the uh, NBL South is what it's called now. But, you know, a lot of a lot of guys go straight over there after um, after their seasons. And I remember that year I was home for five days, six days after my season. We won the championship down there. And I think I went back home from Australia for five days again and then straight to Denmark. So that those two years, I think I was in the state less than two or three weeks, uh, you know, which was a wild ride. But uh, it was I'll do the same thing over and over. It was a great experience down there. Met a lot of good people. Uh, but you do get to Denmark eventually. <laughs> yes. Uh, we took a little detour, but so you do get to Denmark, to Denmark. And, and it's, yeah. it's a really interesting time for you, not only professionally, but personally. Um, and like you said, mm-hmm. Horsens is the club that you wound up going to. You also have, you know, your college teammate there. So from 2012 to 2015, that's largely where you're from. I think we talked off the pod that there is a little stint in Austria there. Uh, mm-hmm. But take me through your first stint in Denmark, and also because we're going to be kind of bookending it here, your current stop is in Denmark for kind of an interesting club relative to uh, yes. basically Absolutely. the rivalry is what I'm getting at. But for now we'll stick with the Horsens aspect. What was it like yeah. playing for them back then, and everything that was going on for you personally, professionally? Yeah, I mean it was that was it's a great experience. I live, um, I actually still live in Horsens now. Uh, my current club is about 30, 45 minutes away, but we're we're uh, have a house there that we're renovating. Renovating, but um, yeah, I mean my first stop uh, in Horsens was uh, it was about as good as it gets. Um, I mean, again, you know, if you want to talk about um, you know the professional aspect, uh, a lot to be desired for. I rode a bicycle every day in the Danish winter, you know, um, but great people in the club, great people in the city. Um, the team was, um, they put us together and we were all young kids. I mean, I think I was 23 my first year here. And I think I was one of the, one of the older ones from what I remember. I think we were, they, you know, not much expectation in the club, but they wanted young guys that wanted to fight and they wanted to build. And um, yeah, it was a great first year. We ended up getting bronze. Uh, we took Bakken, who was obviously is the powerhouse, has always been the powerhouse in Denmark the last 20 years. Um, we took them to game five of the semifinals, and they got beat. Um, but ended up winning the bronze medal. And it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, came back again the next year after a small stint in Austria and um, had another really good year as a team. Um, you know, kept building, kept building uh, – the interest in basketball also in Horsens, you know, we went from playing in, um, you know, this small gym in front of 150 people and then 
you know, by the end of that next year, there was 2000 people in the, the, the big gym, you know, so it was, it was really cool to see how the, the interest generated once, um, you know, we had a, a name in the city, if you will. Uh, so, um, you know, and that led me coming back to the third year where it was kind of the pinnacle um where we uh had even bigger expectations and knew that we could uh we actually we won bronze again the second year we took Bach in the game five again the second year um but that third year uh you know they put a team together that that was even stronger uh even more um experience and um you know that was a magical year that was probably out of the 12 that was the top three year of my career as far as just having fun and enjoying basketball and life outside of basketball. And that was also where uh, the year I met my wife, who was also here from Horsens. And, um, you know, that's uh, obviously a big part of my life now. And we'll probably wind up trying to do this as an extra because you've, you've given another interview where you actually talk about uh, not only the na- potential nationalization or, or I guess basically Denmark would not be inclined to do it, uh, what you <clears throat> intend to do post playing career, uh, but also mm-hmm. in terms of how things are in the country, especially now as you're back in country now playing for Bakken. Um, but moving on from this stint in Denmark, you wind up going to Sweden. You just won the championship yeah. with uh, Horsens in your last year. Um, Danish Cup MVP, Danish Cup winner, Danish League champion, Danish League MVP. Really good 2015 year. Next year, you're looking at available opportunities. You do wind up in Sweden, but take me through that particular stint and what the decision was like in order to wind up making a change and going to Sweden. For sure. For sure. So, I mean, I, I, I still remember, you know, again, um, you know, I met my wife and we were, we were very serious at the time and we, we decided we were going to give it a chance. And so, uh, you know, the decision was in my head, it was either stay in horses and um, probably play the rest of my years in horses, which I was, you know, at the moment, at that time, I was like, you know what, this is a, possibly a good opportunity to really plant my feet in and be comfortable somewhere. Um, you know, the financial aspect I knew would be very limited uh, if I did that. Or it was, you know, take the next step and um, try to climb the ladder. And that was obviously the the, the path I chose. Um, Sud Italia in Sweden, there was a, a very ambitious team and uh, at the time was a, was a powerhouse in Sweden and um, played a European competition. They played a FIBA Europe Cup, which is uh, uh, was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. Once I got that offer, uh, it was I remember it was either between um, between Sud Italia and Sweden or a team in Romania. And um, the the European competition uh, was was the, the the tiebreaker of why I chose Sud Italia. And um, again, I've got very lucky to be in a great situation and, um, you know, got there and uh, had a, had another pretty good year. Another pretty good year. That's, that's a little bit of an undersell (laughs) Swedish league finals, MVP, Swedish league champion. So yeah, very successful year. uh, If we're being completely honest. Yeah, it was, it was a good year. It was Um, a good year. But, you know, since we now know what the end result was, but I, I mean, take me through exactly, you know, you you made the right choice uh, professionally because, you know, you're you're talking about like making the next steps and everything. Uh, we're going to move on to Germany next with your career. But before mm-hmm. we get there, what was it like playing in Sweden for, like you said, a powerhouse club? Yeah, no, it was it was a, a really I mean, from Denmark to Sweden at the time was it was a very logical step. Uh financially also uh was for me it was um it was also a good step for me to take uh it was um you know it was it was just the coach uh my coach in Sud Italia is one of the more respected coaches in Europe uh, in the, in my opinion he was the Bosnian national team coach he's in Belgium now and knew that he was a guy that that created or that developed point guards and guards uh he had had John Robertson for two or three years and John Robertson went on to he actually placed the Bosnian national team now but uh, went from from Sud Italia and to playing top league in France, top league in Australia, you know, and I knew that was what he was known for. And, um, you know, playing in Sud Italia, we had big expectations and uh, they put together, again, really good team. And we played um, FIBA Europe Cup and played all over Europe. But we And we ended up beating, I think we ended up beating every team that we played. We just got beat out. We didn't advance in the group. I mean, we beat Vareza from Italy, top league Italy. We had Brandon Davies. Uh, Malik Wayans, um, you know, high level guys. We ended up beating Gaziantep from Turkey, who had Jawad Williams, Andy Routens, uh, you know, these big name guys. And we're, you know, we're from, from Sweden. And, 
making a lot less money than these guys are. And so it was just a really like really great group of guys, competitors that, uh, that wanted to win. And we just had a, a really tough mindset, tough mentality. And, um, you know, the, uh, playing the FIBA Europe cup was, was the reason why I got to Germany because we also played Frankfurt. They were in our group. That was the one team we didn't beat was Frankfurt who at the time was, um, they actually ended up winning FIBA Europe cup that year. And so the, how I got to Germany was we were playing in Frankfurt and um, I mean, we got beat 25 points, I think, but that game, I had 18 points, I had four or five assists and I played a really good game, you know, and their point guard at the time was Jordan Theodore and they had Johannes Voigtman, they had uh, Danilo Bartzel, they had Fuentes Robertson still, they had, a, I mean, big time German players and, and, and Americans as well. Aaron Dornikant plays in uh, Tenerife still, you know, and so I had a really good game and, uh, so like we were we were playing uh, Frankfurt and they had all these uh, you know very high level players. Now they're all I mean I think four or five of these guys are in Euro league now, and um, Dennis Bucher and um, Stephen Key, who were Dennis is uh, was the head coach for Gießen, and Stephen Key is the assistant was the assistant coach uh, where they're scouting Frankfurt. They, they weren't scouting players, you know they were scouting Frankfurt to play in the next game, and um, saw me play. And um, about a month later, I got a got an email from my agent and he asked me, Hey, what do you think about playing in Germany? Uh, because Giesen is interested in you because they saw you play against Frankfurt. So, you know, again, I, I made the the right decision to go play in the European competition. Um, and it led to me getting the opportunity in Germany. And so we're going to get to Germany. So I think a brief question I have for you is, you know, we were talking earlier about your first stop in Germany where it, it was not necessarily, you said the the quality of the facilities, I guess, was probably a little bit lower than what you were used to in college. And, you know, Horsens, you were talking about how they kind of like consistently got better. But would you say that going to Sweden was mm -hmm. probably the first time overseas that you actually had uh, comparable or maybe better facilities or, or access to, you know, trainers, things like that? Or was that actually when you got in Germany <laughs> the second time? I remember I, yeah, I remember when we went to, when I got to Sweden, I thought it was cool that we had our own locker room for instance, in the gym, you know, very small thing. But in my stops before, it was just borrowed locker rooms that we used for gyms and for our games and practices. Um, but in Sudatalia, I remember I thought, I was like, oh, this is very professional. You know, we had our own locker rooms. Uh, we got the gym whenever we needed it for the most part. We had a weight coach, you know, and that was the first time overseas that I had any of that. Um, you know, I still walked to the gym. I didn't have a car. Um, so that part was still, you know, but I mean, it's right. You know, we live close to the gym, so it wasn't a big deal. But still, it was Sweden, and it was freezing all the time uh, in the winter. Um, so yeah, I mean, that it was a step up from from where I had been as far as professionalism. You know, and then we played FIBA Europe Cup, where we flew places, and you know, so that was obviously a great experience to have. Yeah. So at this point in your career, it's now about four years in or so. So as a frame of reference, <clears> that uh, you are working your way up, but it's about four years in that you're actually starting to see some that's exactly right yeah that's so, exactly right yes that's uh, exactly right so germany back to germany but this time uh little little higher level of competition we'll say it that way uh Absolutely. you spend the next four years continuously in germany and you'll you'll go back again at the at the highest level but uh like you said Giesen was the one that started inquiring about you and that's going to be the first one that you're there in germany with and germany's a yeah. again a very notable stint for you Take us through what it was like playing in Germany. Three different clubs. Uh, actually, a couple of mm -hmm. friends of the pod, Devin Oliver and Mike Morrison, are going to crisscross <laughs> you here. Uh, exactly. So feel feel free to throw in any good stories about them. But in terms of what your your experience was like in Germany at this point in time, take us through what that was like in your career. Yeah, you know, I mean, going from Sweden to the Bundesliga, I think is um, at the time wasn't a very common thing. You know, I was very, I felt very very blessed, very lucky to have that opportunity because that in my head didn't happen. Uh, and so, you know, I knew it was going to be a, a huge challenge, huge challenge. You know, I didn't really know what role I was going to have, you know, was I going to be a backup, this and that. And, um, you know, I got there and then, you know, the, the, the main thing was just the, the practices. Uh, you know, we had a, we had a really good team. If you go back and look at my roster in Geeson, we had some, some high level players that were at the beginning of their career. And so our practices were, were super competitive, super competitive. And so, um, ended up going to that first year and I actually was, I started out pretty strong. And then, you know, I had a lot of peaks and valleys, a lot of peaks and valleys and ended up, we, um, we had a great year. We finished ninth place. We finished a game or two, uh, a game or two. I can't remember out of the playoffs. And um, 
you know, if if you uh, understand the Bundesliga, Gießen is always a pretty uh, pretty much a, a lower budget team. Um, have never really had much money, and it was very true back then. Also, again, I, you know, I go to the Bundesliga, and you know, when my agent told me, uh, "Yeah, you go to the Bundesliga and play," I was like, "Oh, thank God, make some make real money finally." You know, that, that wasn't I made better money, but it's still I, I wasn't even close to what I thought was like a living yet. Um, but it was uh, it was a great experience. And then it, again, it kind of opened up a lot more doors for me professionally um, because I got to go to continue to rise the ladder in, in Germany because I you know had had a good year. and um, Other teams were interested in me. So from there, um, I go to Jena, Germany, which is uh, more in the eastern part of Germany and you know, wasn't really sure what to expect. Uh, we had a, a lot of uh, veterans on that team. So I'm going in and I think I'm 26. And I'm, I think I was the youngest American that we had. We had uh, three guys that were 38, I think, 37, 38 is in the BBL. Uh, Derek Allen, Julius Jenkins, and Emmanuel McElroy. Um, great guys, great vets to have. And then, um, you know, I think, again, I was 26, 27. I can't remember what year that was. But, um, you know, completely different type of team than we had in Gießen. In Gießen, we were all young and hungry. And then, and, you know, we were like veteran team who just really, you know, worked and were tough and knew, you know, knew how to play. And so it was a really different experience from year to year, which was, was great for me. Because, again, I'm still learning the European high level game and was uh, was, uh, you know, we had a coach who played a completely different style than what I would played before. And um, it really helped me grow. And I had a probably the at that, up to that point, um, the best year of my career personally. Um, stats wise, no, but the level that I played at the whole year, I felt like was, was my best year that I played at up to that point. And so, um, you know, from there, uh, to Würzburg and, um, spent two great years in Würzburg and had a third year on my contract. Uh, unfortunately COVID, um, came and, um, hurt that, uh, you know, Würzburg got really got hit hard by, by COVID and the, the money really dropped. And so, um, I think three or four of us had contracts for the next year and was going to be all of our third year there. And uh, I loved Würzburg. I still have great friends in Würzburg and um, had two good years. We finished um, ninth my first year right outside the playoffs. Uh, and then um, also got also made the FIBA Europe Cup finals. Well, that was the second year. In second year in Würzburg, we've made the FIBA Europe Cup finals. And um, hold on, wait a second now. That was the first year. I get my years mixed up. That was the first year. We made the FIBA Europe Cup finals. And then the second year, we were actually eighth, and then COVID hit. And, um, you know, that was that. And, unfortunately, had to uh, choose a new uh, new team the next year. We have merch. Head over to the Expat Hoop Store where you'll find T-shirts, hoodies, masks, coffee mugs, pint glasses, and more. It's one of many ways you can show support for the podcast. So head over there and pick up some merch. That link below is in the video description, or you can head over to our website, expathoops.com, and click Merch. We offer a couple of different Expat Hoops logos, and we have men's, women's, and kids' sizes, so you can get something for everyone. Thanks to SeatGeek for sponsoring Expat Hoops. We recently became a brand ambassador for them. SeatGeek is a ticket app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets. They offer a 0 to 10 score on each ticket to know if you're getting a good or a bad deal. Green means good, red means bad. You get the idea. It's a really easy way to get tickets to events. Plus, our viewers get $20 off their first ticket purchase with the Expat Hoops code. Click the link in the description to download the app. Remember the code, Expat Hoops, E-X-P-A-T-H-O-O-P-S, all one word, to save yourself $20 off your first ticket purchase with SeatGeek. In our house, when we use a VPN, we are sure to use NordVPN. NordVPN secures up to six devices and is compatible with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and even your Wi-Fi router. Plus, it's no risk to your wallet. Head over to their website for pricing or contact customer support 24-7. And remember, your purchase is always safe with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the video description to use our code and make sure you're secure with NordVPN. So that was actually kind of one of the things off the pod we were talking about. Um, we were kind of having a, a general conversation about pay overseas and when you're just starting out and it was kind of went different ways. But one of the things I thought you kind of told me that was interesting about Wurzburg is, um, you know, like I said, we've we've talked with Devin Oliver before. We've talked with Mike Morrison. <clears throat> 
high level club in the Bundesliga, but I thought it was interesting what you were saying about pre COVID that, you know, it was a good, good paying club. And that after COVID, you know, from what you understand from talking to a lot of the people that you're, you're still friendly mm-hmm. with that that's been one of the teams that, like you said, has been hit hard by COVID. Absolutely. 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 No, it was, um, I mean, again, I, me and my wife have uh, nothing but great things to say about Würzburg, the club, the city, uh, loved everything about it would probably still be there if COVID hadn't hit. That's how much we loved it. Um, yeah, it was just, it's very tough. You know, the, the main sponsor was a clothing brand S Oliver and um, he, they decided to also leave the club. So it gave him even less money. So, um, you know, they were just really hit hard and they've had to make a lot of sacrifices, a lot of changes um, are actually performing really well this year. They put together a great team um and a uh, great coaching staff and they've completely revamped everything they've done um but for sure i mean i think you could ask anybody uh involved in the team and they're for sure one of the lower three or four budgets in the in the bundesliga yeah but again you know if from the player standpoint that's a place that you historically might have looked at and said oh they pay well and you know it's good that they've adapted but yes. that's and they were one of the clubs that was able to do that post covid uh, and that's great. And hopefully, you know, better days mm-hmm. are ahead. But again, mm-hmm. looking at it historically, thinking, oh, there's money in Germany, blah, blah, blah. Not necessarily the case. You really got to no. dig into the details. I, I'm, I'm telling you the the difference, the difference from club to club, as far as, you know, again, relatively speaking, having money, not having money is, is people wouldn't believe, you know, a guy signs in a club and thinks he's, you know, getting a hundred grand and most likely he's not touching that, getting close to it. You know, that's just, uh, that's just the reality these days. And that's something that we might do as a future uh, sort of forum Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly would love to have you back at that point in time. But we actually (laughs) wanted to move on to, we were talking about this off the pod. So your next stop would be Greece and then you'd end up in Poland. Uh, You you said that this, even though Germany is a really great stint in your career, uh, this is a really good story. So we'll let you take, take this one with you wind up going to Greece and then you wind up going to Poland. So take us through the very interesting, I wouldn't say post COVID, but probably post covid outbreak year so it's yeah a heck of a year for everybody but you especially yeah. where you you thought you're going to be going back to Würzburg, you wind up going to greece and then poland so take us through that crazy year so yeah uh well the craziest thing was my son was born uh in Würzburg, germany um may th- or march 30th of 2020 and so uh the season was canceled i think march 12th 13th is when our season they said okay we're suspending it now and then you know, it got canceled later on. So, you know, my son was born March 30th, 2020. And so, um, you know, and then Würzburg dissolved all of our contracts because, you know, the COVID obviously, you know, financial stuff. And so I was kind of, to be honest, I was just kind of mad at everything in Germany. And I was like, you know what? I'm done with Germany right now. I want a new chance. I said, told my agent, you know, let's get out of Germany. Let's see. Let's see what happens. And um, this opportunity in Greece comes up. Thessaloniki, Greece. I mean, Google Thessaloniki, Greece. And it is just, it's a beautiful place beautiful place and then you know the club uh uh Iraklis was uh had great talks with everybody in the club uh they signed a, a good team and you know Greece is a uh, not an easy place to be at sometimes uh I love the people there uh and within the club they treated me great um but it was a tough year uh, we started out missing uh Champions League qualifications we got beat in the first round very disappointing um and then from then on, it was kind of an uphill battle. I think we, we actually started out the season decent, four and two, four and three. And um, again, Greece is a different different animal when it comes to, to wins and losses. And uh, our coach resigned or got fired um, and it killed me. It was one of the, I think it was the first time I'd ever had a coach. You know, this is your 10, I think, at the time. And first time I'd ever had a coach get fired in the season, which is very lucky from my standpoint. But you know, and I love the guy. He was a great guy, better person than coach. You know, he's a great coach also. But, um, you know, we had issues that we couldn't figure out. And uh, the uh, I guess the management thought that it was time for him to go. So, you know, that happens. And then we, we get another coach. and He's there a month. And we end up losing the cup game to our rival, Pauk. He gets fired. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm you know, and a lot of stuff was going on behind the scenes. Some some stuff with the fans. I was getting some pretty wild uh um social media stuff that I had not dealt with to be honest before and it probably affected me maybe more than it should but um it was some some personal stuff that I wasn't very comfortable with and I told my agent uh and we had again we had some issues with the fans at games also even though it was supposed to be no fans at the games there was always 
somehow fans at the games along with 100 riot police. But, um, you know, I told Major, I said, nah, I'd like to get out of here. So I asked for my release and, um, you know, had a, uh, a little bit difficult to getting out of there, but ended up getting out and choosing to go to Poland. And uh, thought I was walking into a good situation. Again, good people, uh, great teammates I had in Poland, great coach, Jean Tabak, former NBA player, uh, former Maccabi Tel Aviv coach. Um, and he was really good. And, um, you know, ended up uh, making the VTB playoffs, uh, finishing first and thinking the regular season, finishing first in Poland. Um, and ended up getting beat the finals. Uh, it was a tough year, tough, tough finish for me. Didn't didn't play very well, and then also didn't uh, didn't get paid uh, from my from my club there. So it was a a very rough year, along with having a raising a one year old that didn't decide not to sleep the whole first year <laughs> was a uh, was a was a wild wild ride. But it was uh, again, you know, it was uh, an experience that that was uh, you deal with, and uh, I look back on it, and I'm grateful for it. But uh, it was uh, a wild ride. That whole year was was very interesting. I've got some great stories from that year. Uh, Good yeah, and bad. This is going to be a kind of a preview, but we're going to ask you what your wildest overseas story is. And I have a feeling it's going to probably be this, or it's going to be one of the stories anyway. But one of the things yeah. we were talking about off the pod as well about Poland that's really notable here, you're still looking to be paid. Yeah, that is a, a tough situation there. Um, yeah, my Polish team, you know, they they just they paid me one uh, one salary while I was there. I was and had to go through FIBA court, and it took me a year, and we won. And um, yeah, still waiting on that money. So uh, uh, who knows when and what? But um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough situation. I mean, all of our guys from that year are missing paychecks, and I'm positive that they're missing paychecks this year, unfortunately. Um, but that's kind of how they do things, it seems. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. But that's uh, that's uh, how it goes sometimes over here. And, and it definitely should not. And, well, yeah, certainly. And one of the interesting things in talking to you off the pod that I thought was really interesting was when you were – the battle over the contract. You wanted the FIBA clause in there. Um, and kind of what the battle over it was is whether to go to FIBA courts or whether to go – oh, just go through the Polish courts. They're quicker mm -hmm. and they're everything. And so I think that exactly. kind of what you're alluding to with your teammates still looking for a paycheck – their contracts may have said go through the courts in Poland, which I don't mm -hmm. know, maybe I'm the only person that's interested in this as a lawyer. Hopefully our listeners are not been like, <laughs> I'm fast forwarding the next five minutes. But I think that's kind of interesting that they were they were basically trying to steer you towards the Polish courts and presumably so they would get away with not not paying you. That's that's exactly what it was. And again, I'm not saying that the Polish courts are not enforcing anything, but I know that there are real consequences for not paying in FIBA courts. And that's why. Thankfully, I have a, an agent that pushed me to to not uh, sign until they put that clause in there because, um, you know, I don't care who knows this if any Polish people are watching this, but you know they can't sign any players until they pay me my money. Uh, so that's the that's the situation. But yeah, I mean, they for sure try to get around paying their players any way they can. It's a very tough situation that those guys that we were in, and I'm sure the guys are in today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we will move on a little bit because it can be a little bit of a we could go on for an hour. Oh, we could go on and on on Absolutely. this alone. Uh, but you do wind up going back to Germany again. You go back to Bonn um, before you wind up going back to your current stint in Denmark. So what was it like in terms of going back to Bonn for another year? Like you said, you were kind of you're upset at Germany. You kind of had the experience. You're like, all right, maybe Germany's not so bad. <laughs> no, so. I, I, no, I promise you, you can, you can call my agent, Matt Slynn. And I remember, I remember the first conversation we had was like, yo, I want to go back to Germany. I don't care where we're going. Germany, you know, that's where we're going. That's for sure. And um, the situation in Bonn came up and, um, you know, I didn't really care. Uh, you know, obviously I cared a little bit about the money, but not that much. You know, I took a, to be honest, I took a small cut to go back to Germany. Um, but I told him I just want to be in a good situation. I don't really care if, you know, the role, I don't care if I, you know, at this point in my career, I just wanted to be on a successful team. Um, that, and, and Vaughn had a, a huge project. They'd just signed a new coach, Thomas Isolo, um, who is, will be a EuroLeague or wherever he wants to be in the next two to three years. I'm sorry, he's one of the best coaches in Europe. Um, and I knew they wanted to win. Uh, and, you know, they know what type of player that I was. And they thought I brought 
uh, you know, a little bit of leadership, a little bit of stability, a little bit of toughness to the team. And um, I was very fortunate enough to get an offer from there. And as soon as they offered, I said, let's go. And um, uh, one of the, the best year uh, at, at team wise. And, you know, even, even individually, I feel like I played really well for most of the year and, uh, you know, at a very high level team, we finished, I think, third in the regular season in the Bundesliga. Um, and then ended up taking Bayern Munich uh, Euroleague team to, to game five of the semifinals and just had a, such a special group of guys. I mean, those guys are – I'd go to war with those guys any day of the week. They're the toughest, like, just just most competitive group of guys I've ever been around, uh, along with our coaching staff, uh, Thomas Isolo, Jonas Isolo, Adrian Kovac, like, all these guys. Like, we all had one goal. No one cared who got the credit. And um, man, it was just it was just a magical year. And that that bond, uh, bond is a, is an unbelievable place. Six thousand people arena, beautiful, great facilities, very professional. Um, just a, a great, great, great place to be. And so you don't don't leave Germany for really just any place. Uh, it's places near and dear to your heart. And you're you're winding up this season mm-hmm. back in Denmark. But again, so we alluded to earlier on, uh, <clears throat> Bach and it's come up before because they were the ones that uh, have largely been the top dog in that league. I don't know. It's, right. it's easy to say the New York Yankees of, of any particular league, but it's really not a bad comparison because yeah. uh, when you were back at Horsens, they had won like the previous like three or four championships. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Horsens wins two, one with you, one the next year. And then pretty much ever since then, it's back to Bakken. Um, So yes. you're now in Denmark again on the other side. Uh, what's it like playing for really kind of the top club? Not only that, but what's it like playing for a club that, um, you know, it, having been on the other side with horses where you were challenging and challenging this club, what's that like yeah. for you? You know, it was, uh, it wasn't a, I'm not going to say it was an easy decision because it wasn't, but whenever me and my wife decided that we would wanted to come back to Denmark, we knew that um, the best opportunity for, for my professional career was to come to Bakken. Uh, I mean, again, it's not a, it's not a, a secret in Danish basketball that uh, the financial situation in sports and especially in basketball is not the best. And Bakken gives the um, best opportunity for me to continue um, to make a, to make a living playing basketball, just to be completely honest. And not only that, that it was obviously a, one one decision, but the the main the main reason was Bakken is, is an unbelievable club. They're very ambitious. Um, they gave me the opportunity to continue to play at a high level while being around family. Uh, we we play Champions League, which is an unbelievable level to play at. Um, and we had the we, Bakken gives the opportunity to play that, and uh, we were fortunate enough to play in the qualifications, and um, and we we achieved our goal. And um, yeah, I mean, Bakken, they, they really have uh, ambitious goals and it's a great club, great people in the club. Um, you know, it was tough to say no to Horsens or not signing Horsens. Uh, you know, my best friend in the entire world is the head coach uh, for Horsens. We, we were teammates together uh, for two years while, while, while I was here, um, you know, and it's it's always weird. You know, again, we, we me and him talk and have coffee all the time, uh, except the weeks that we're playing each other. Uh, so it's a, it's a funny, funny dynamic that we have, but, um, you know, that's our, that's our life. And, um, you know, basketball is just a part of that, but, uh, yeah, this, uh, Lucas Varga, if he's watching this, he'll, he'll laugh, but yeah, he's my best friend in the world and he's, uh, the, the head coach of my rival team. So it's, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. For sure. And so what do you, uh, I mean, really in terms of how the league is or, or how things are going so far within league play, I think last I checked Horsens was up there, uh, near the top, uh, in terms mm-hmm. of how the league, how, How's playing out this year? How is that going for you in terms of where the team expects <clears> to be and and where you see the rest of the year going within league play? Obviously, like you said, Champions League is another thing that you're also dealing with. But in terms of like mm-hmm. within league play, where do you see things going this year? So we've actually lost a few games, a couple of games we shouldn't have. Uh, we we came back from the qualification Champions League and dropped a, a game that, to be honest, we should never lose uh, to a team that's a lower team in the league. We beat them by 50 points yesterday. Um, but you know, we slipped up two games. We slipped up like this, that we should teams to, to be honest. I mean, it's clear we should never lose two. Um, and then we lost a, a team that, uh, nested, uh, in the Danish league who has actually a ton of talent and, um, yeah, we, they, they beat us. There's no excuse. Uh, so we're, I think we're nine and three in the Danish league. Um, you know, the reality is we're, we are the favorites and everybody would is gunning for us. And it's, you know, those, those are not easy games ever. And, uh, 
people are always going to give you their best shot. And um, that's what we're dealing with every game. That's what we're dealing with every game. Uh, and so it's uh, it's going to be a long rest of the way. We've got one game in Champions League left, I believe. Uh, we don't have a chance to qualify for the next round, unfortunately. So uh, it's full focus on the Danish League. And um, we've got a lot of work to do. So we've covered quite a bit of ground here uh, and going over your career now, decade plus career. Uh, kind of wanted to expand on a few extra things that we've kind of hit here. Would you be willing to stick around and do some extras with us? Let's go. All right. So we will uh, add those extras uh, for anybody that's watching on YouTube, for anybody that's listening on our audio side, be sure to go over to our YouTube page. That's where you'll find the extras is the only place where you'll find that content. But again, Skylar, uh, we'll get into some extras momentarily, but thank you so much for sitting down on the regular portion of the pod, going over your career, uh, giving us some of the great stories and looking forward to hearing some of the uh, great stories in the extras as well. Yeah, let's do it. Hello, and thanks for watching. Be sure to give the video a like and you can watch more videos over here. Uh, you can also click subscribe over here so you're notified when we have new content here on Expat Hoops.